What does it feel like to get shot? She grabbed the gun, pointed it at me. She looked me in my eyes, and when she realized that I was heartless or cold-hearted, it scared her. She tried to uncock the gun, but didn't know how. And so when she was lowering the gun, it went off, hit me in the lower abdomen, and the bullet exploded inside of me and ripped from her artery. That's when life shifted for me completely. What does it feel like to get shot? Well, I got shot with a 38 caliber, long-grained. And that's the one that you usually see the police officers have in their bootstrap. They always use that as a backup because it's a powerful caliber pistol. And when it hit me, it felt like a semi-truck hit my body like I was up against a wall. And in that moment, I remember thinking. I was always a smart kid. Always. I was always, you know, advanced than most kids in, in, in my age group. And so, you know, what my dad wanted was me to be more like him. And how he did it was he made me feel like the only way that I could actually have time with him, spend time with him, was that I had to show him how to use my education or my, my smarts to advance in the streets. And so I remember graduating, uh, getting ready to go into high school, and I had a 3.8 GPA. And I'm like, yo, Pops, you know, I, I just want a car. You know, you help me get a car. And, and I'll never forget this day. He looked at the report card. He ripped it in half, ripped it a few times. Just laughing through it. He's like, man, no. He said, this is how you get what you want. And I'll never forget, he came in with a half a brick or a half a kilo, whatever you guys want to call it, of uh, cocaine. And um, handed me my first pistol. And he says, well, if you want the car, and you go out and you earn it. And I, I remember from that day, I'll never forget, I was like, wow, who does that? Who says that to the, you know, <laughs> to the you know, six-year-old son? Right. But it didn't, it didn't seem abnormal to the extent that that's what it, all my brothers, right? Mm -hmm. That's what everybody was doing. But again, that internal, that, that inner was like, man, nah, this ain't it. Where, where I'm just, just, I'm just, I'm just really curious person. Where did he go to get the brick of cocaine? Where was it exactly? Did he go unlock a safe somewhere or was it in nah, a closet? He, he, I was in my room. He so we had that conversation in the evening, and then the next morning, that's how he woke me up. He threw it at, threw it at in the bed. I, I remember <laughs> because when he threw, and he threw it, okay. it, it hit me in the rib, mm -hmm. and and I, and and in the pain, like I, I thought he broke something. Mm -hmm. He tossed it across the room. He's like, and he threw the, the half a kilo, and he threw the, the gun. Um, but then there was a part of me that was excited. Because I'm like, for the first time, oh, I was like, shit, I get to actually, I get an opportunity now to actually build this relationship with my dad. Wow. So it wasn't even about selling drugs. It was about just no. getting closer to your dad. That was the way to get close to your, your yeah. role model. Yeah. Because in the midst of all that, hanging out with him and him showing me the streets, you know, ice cream trucks, all the stuff, you know, I'm a kid. So, you know, he wads of money, like whatever we want to do, street fairs. So he pacified me with all of the little, the little low hanging fruits, you know, anything that the right. kid wants. And that, that felt good. So I didn't really, you, you know, make a big deal about going on the rides and the ride alongs and all the different things. Even though I saw things that didn't feel good, they, and you know, I seen things that would scare the average person, but also was like, I get to be with my dad and then all the little things that come with it. I just tune that stuff out. Did you feel competent in, in flipping that, that brick of cocaine, like how to do that and how to stay safe in doing so and all of those things or. You, you, you know, it's, it's like, it's like that relationship, like that girl or that guy you always wanted. And there's a part of you where you'll tell yourself, I'll do whatever it takes to get, to get, to get that person. Um, and so 
that relationship that I wanted with my dad, I knew that I had enough drive, enough charisma to figure it out. I knew that I had enough in me to impress him. Now, I didn't know exactly what that entailed until I had those real experiences. So you can have an idea about something. You can have an idea of how you want to approach something. But then when you hit that real experience, what it opens you up to. That's where the real shift happened. Because I had to become something that I actually wasn't. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. So what was your first step in that direction towards becoming a drug dealer. How'd you make your first sale? Well, it wasn't even my first sale. I wanted to show my dad that I was with the shits. Um, he took me on a ride along. Guy which me. means, which means what? A ride along where, you know, he did his roots, stopped by his, 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 his spots. He picked up his money where he, you know, along the trail, uh, who he sold to and mm -hmm. We went to a guy's house and the guy owed him some money. And I remember my dad being upset. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, ah, this is my moment. And I'm like, this is my moment. I'm, I'm going to collect for my dad. He doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to show him that I, I can do this. And so later on that night, I remember putting on a wig and a house coat. And I got on a bike. I had a 10 speed at the time. Who, whose wig did you put on? Your mom's? My grandmother's. I was staying with my dad. So I, I'm now I'm, I'm staying with my dad. Which he okay. took, Yeah. You know, I love you know, my stories. are They're fun. You can laugh because it, I laugh through them. Even when I hear myself think about this stuff, you have to. Uh, okay. But, <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all good. <laughs> so I'm living with, I'm living with his mom because he, he never let, he, he had, you couldn't, he never let anybody know. Nobody knew where he laid his head. Never okay. So I'm staying with his mom, mm -hmm. which is my grandmother, who's deceased now. Um, but I put on her wig and I, I cause I just, you know, I, I knew I wanted to look different. I just knew that it, from, you know, watching movies and reading stories about how to just camouflage yourself mm -hmm. or, or disguise yourself. So I, I put on the disguise and I remember I, I rode up to the house. And I had a 357 and I could see the shadows in the house. I seen people. And I remember I just pulled the trigger and let off a few shots and I, in the air. No, in the house, into the house. I hit the house. I was trying to hit the shadow. And why were you trying to, why were you trying to, to shoot the guy? Um, because you had a conversation with him already. No, that I just heard my dad's conversation with, uh, with the guy. I was there. I was standing there. You know, he saw me. I, I, mean, I was in the room while they were having the conversation. Um, but again, I'm I'm doing it the way I think the streets work. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how this works. This is my first. Remember, you asked me how did I get there. So this was my. Right. This was me seeing if this was me introducing myself to this life, seeing if I really had what it took. And you already knew how to shoot a gun, or was that your first time shooting a gun? No, I knew how to shoot a gun. Okay. All right. So you shoot into the house. I shoot into the house. The shadow moves. It hits. The, it just drops. I, I see it standing up, and then I see the shadow go hit the ground. Well, the next day, my dad gets a phone call from the guy, and he says, man, come get all your money. I got it. So my dad, we, we, we go. You know, I'm excited because I know what happened. Right? I, I know why the guy's calling. I didn't kill him, thank God. But when I get there, what happens is he tells my dad, hey, man, I'm sorry, I got your money. He, and then he's like, he didn't blame my dad, but he's like, I don't know, somebody came. He's like, and they shot into my house. He says, and uh, just so happened, I happened to bend over to pick my daughter up. Mm -hmm. And the bullet missed me. And then that's when and, and I remember trembling in my, in my, in my shoes, like, like, damn. Like, how could have killed this guy? 
or I could have killed his daughter. And I was like, okay, rule number one, no drive-bys. We're not, one thing I won't do is just shoot randomly. I said, if it's ever going to be an, inst an instance where I have to use a gun, it's got to be face to face. Right. And so what I realized was there was two, there was two versions of this street life mm -hmm. that pretend there's that, there's that pretend, you know, Hollywood version where you, you see the things in the movies. And then there's that, that mobster life when you watch narcos or stuff like that, where you hear how they really make moves happen. And so I had to ask myself, how serious do you want to be, Arjuna? Like, how deep do you want to go down this rabbit hole? Mm -hmm. in order to have this relationship with your father. Did you ever tell him that you were the one that shot into the window? He knew it. He knew it. I didn't know. He, he knew it. He looked at me. He just, he knew it. He, he, it was like this moment where it was like this proud father moment. He looked over at me and he had this smirk on his face. He never, mm -hmm. we never had a full, we never had a full conversation about it, but it, it was like this nod. He gave me like, okay. I see you. you're ready. And then he sent me on, he sent me on my first real big assignment. Okay. Which was why <laughs> <laughs> you got everybody let's, sitting on the edge of their yeah. seats. Let's just say, uh, <laughs> I had enough drugs to probably get three natural life sentences. So he mm -hmm. started me out with just, you, you know, I was, I was a driver. New license, no tickets, nothing. So I would drive and move massive amounts. Um, I earned, you know, and I so remember I have, a, I have brothers. I have, I have like seven or eight brothers that are older than me. I was the youngest. And all I could remember was like how I want to advance. When I, I want to get past it. I need to do things in a way that it's cutting edge. Smart. And so now what's interesting like, is my spiritual practice started to somehow I integrated it in this lifestyle. So then I came up with my own rules. I didn't hurt people. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the same time, I'm hurting people. Right. But I didn't consciously go out and hurt people for no reason. Um, I had compassion. You know, I took care of kids. I took care of single moms that were on drugs. Like, and I was like, I remember being told one day, because I didn't, on Sundays, I would be at the temple. And one day I was at one of my locations speaking to some of people that I would, uh, where I would distribute my drugs and they made a joke. Like you're the only drug dealer I know who goes to church on Sunday. You know, and at the time, when it first, when, when, when the woman first said it, I was like, wait, damn, that's a hell of a contradiction, right? Like, how am I a drug dealer? But I'm known for being in church. On, and I'm known in the streets for being in church on Sunday. And a part of me was like, whoa. I felt it. I was like, at some point, that's going to catch up with you, Arjuna. And so I, I thought, well, okay, well, then you need to advance. You need to get this moving. You need to get to the top as fast as you can. And from there, what does the top look like from that in that scene in Detroit? Like, what what do you imagine the top to be to be like? Are you are you Al uh, Capone? Are you like what's so? What are you aspiring to? At that time, when you say the top, there were there were individuals that you would see that the way they would move through the streets, it was as if they had a cape on. Mm -hmm. Right. They could go anywhere and they got respect. Like, and I used to marvel, like, how can one man control a whole neighborhood or a whole side of a town where this person is evil, corrupt, but somehow they have so much power in the streets that no one ever would challenge them. Right. I'm like, this person can be outnumbered and taken down. And I was like, man, how do I reach that? 
how do I get to a point where as a solo being, you would question yourself if you decided to do anything or approach me in any way. Um, and so that's what I consider to be the top. Got it. So what did you do? Um, I, and so the term that we use is I just kept putting in the work. I, I kept showing up. Uh, and then I got to a place where what I learned was that my dad never really cared in a sense. Right. Because when you step back and you look at it, you're like, well, how could you say you love your kids? Or how could you say you love your son if this is what you're teaching them? This is where you're putting them. And so that reality became real. One day, me and my dad decided to have a conversation about growing. I was like, hey, dad, I've, I've reached this level. I'm ready to create my own, you know, entourage, my own group. And he was like, no, it don't work like that. You only do what you do through me. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I know the numbers now. I see how this system works. You know, and I've built this courage up in myself. I've built this level of mindset. So I'm like, Pops, don't work like that. You're making all the money. So I did the ultimate, what you don't do. You see it in all the movies. I went directly to the connect. How old were you? At this time, I believe I was 20. Uh, 18, somewhere 18, between 18 and 20. This is before, before you got shot. You got shot at 19, so it would be before before that. Yes. Were you, was you, were you in school, like high school? Did you drop out of school? Like you were a 3.8 grade point average student. What happened yeah. to that? Never dropped out of school. Kept going. I, I, I had a, a way about myself that I carried myself in such a debonair way, in such a, a, a very suave, you know, um, I, I took on some of my dad's characters, very very smooth, but manipulative. And, and what I did was I would just go into the to class. The teachers understood that someone's different about me. But I had a way of using my words and I, I would just get my work in advance. I would tell a story, hey, teacher, this is what's going on in my life. Da, da, da. Get the work in advance, turn it all in at the end of the week. Um, and that's how I did it. I never stopped going to school. I never stopped educating myself either. Right. So you were doing the school work during the day and the street work. During the day. I mixed it all. Up. During the day. <laughs> okay. So you, you went to the connect and what happened then? You know, money talks. Uh, this, this guy was my dad's childhood friend. So you know, he broke it down. He says, Look, technically I should kill you. He said, I've been watching you. And I've always had this about me where people were fond of my personality. I was different. Mm. But it, and, I, and now I realize what it was. It was, it was the spiritual practices that were in rooted it, but I didn't know it at the time. And so he was like, hey, I'm going to do this. But you know what this means. And you know where this is going to change your relationship. He says, but if you're willing to go there, put your money on the table. And now, wasn't he risking retaliation from your dad by doing, cutting that deal with you? Not necessarily because see, in the streets, you understand, you know, it's a part where money take that. And that's what we hear about all the time. You know, how money corrupts, how money changes the way we do things, how we allow money to influence. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, it was like, well, the money was there. So from a street perspective, like he had his money, his money was together. Right. So, and as far as he was concerned, that conflict was between you and your dad. He didn't really care where the money came from. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's how it works. It's like, hey, this is between you and your people. As long as you're good here, we're good. I have nothing mm -hmm. to do with what happens outside once you walk out of this door. All right. And sure enough, I got the phone call. I'm sure he called your dad right away. Oh, man, I got the phone call. <laughs> what happened from there, man, my dad put a hit out on me. Okay, what, what does that mean exactly? I defied all orders. I put a hit out on me like, hey, bring him to me dead or alive. I had a bounty on my head by my own dad. And so this played out for about two or three years. We would see each other in the streets. 
at lights. He'd pull out a gun, I'd pull out mine. Or at the temple, he'd see my mom. And uh, I, it, it, it got real when he told my mom one Sunday, he saw her in front of the temple. They both went on a Sunday. And he told her, he says, hey, when I see your son, I'm killing him. And she cried. And she didn't know how to tell me that he told her those words. And I wasn't even mad that he said he was going to kill me. The fact that she shed a tear. And from, th from that point forward, my relationship with my dad, it was war, all out war. Because one thing that I did know through my whole journey, like, is that my mom never left me hanging. Even though my dad said things about her, and even though I was living with him for a time, my mom has always been, to this date, a spiritually loving, compassionate, kind person. You know, she had her challenges, her drama, her stories, but she always practiced what she preached. So had you developed that trust in your mom at that point? Because earlier you said you did not trust your mom. No. I didn't because I did. At that time I had developed it, but I didn't trust her because she had to turn me in where I was admitted to the mental hospital when I was 16 for an incident that happened between my dad and I. And I told the therapist. And the therapist asked me, well, would you ever hurt your dad? And I said, yeah, I'm angry enough to hurt him. She says, well, how? I said, with this Glock that I have on my hip. And at that time, I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that I'm just being able, I'm, I'm like, this is my counsel. You be honest. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I didn't know. So she, you know, as soon as I left out, she hit the button. And, and so my mom gets a phone call. It's like, hey, your son is armed and dangerous. And if you don't, you got less than 24 hours to turn him in. If we find him, we might kill him. So my mom called me, whatever. And I ended up getting admitted. And I turned 17 in the mental institution because I was so angry. So to have that experience and to be put in a padded room and be in a straitjacket and all that. And through all this whole story and everything that we're talking about, the only thing that I can tell you that was really wrong with me, like, was just that I was hurt, deeply hurt mm -hmm. and abandoned. Like, I didn't feel like I had anybody. That was it. But just from those two feelings, I was able to fuel myself in a way that made me dangerous. But mm -hmm. I, was a different, I was a different kind of dangerous. So between you and your dad, was, was one of you bluffing? Like, why didn't, why did it take so long? Like you said two or three years, you guys were chasing each other around like, like Pacino and, and De Niro and Heat. Yeah, I, because I, I realized, you know, what happened was I realized I was the first person that was able to get behind my dad's card. Like, I was the first one that actually got to see him see him, right? Mm-hmm. No one else would be close enough to him. He never let anybody get close enough to him to really read his true demeanor. I figured it out. You know, from going to therapists, being locked up in the institution, I learned a different psychology. And so I was able to get inside. And then once I was able to get inside his head, I was like, oh, you're a normal human being like everybody else. Mm -hmm. You just have a damn good mask. I was like, and once I figured that out, I, for me, it was now it was joy because I'm like all those years of what I watched him do to my mom. So I, I actually let it carry on. Mm -hmm. I thrived off of letting my brothers and sisters see how I would put my dad in this state of fear. Cause he, he, he told my older brother, like, I think I created a monster hmm. and he didn't know how to turn me off. But then, mm -hmm. you know, part of that, it gets good to you, right? The intention was to do this, but then there's that power that comes with it. Then there's this, the, the voids of the hurt and the suffering. I started feeding that through, the, through, through our interactions, through the fear that I saw in him. So all that is happening in the background. You're 19 years old. And you're in your apartment with your girlfriend or some woman you were dating or how, what was that? How do you explain that relationship again? Cause it's very complicated. Yeah. Uh, so me and, and this young lady, as you fast forward to this moment that you're getting ready, we're getting ready to drop into, uh, I had a team. Um, this young lady was part of that team and, uh, I compromised. I broke one of the, the protocols. You know, I, I became intimate with her and then we shared that space. 
uh, from a street perspective, you usually don't mix that because it can turn into something where either you compromise or you find yourself in a situation where you let your emotions get in the way of that lifestyle. So that's what happened. And my dad, at this time, we had, we, we didn't really resolve our issue, but we understood that if we worked together, we could do far more greater things than fight, right? Mm -hmm. And so somehow naturally we ended up getting back in, in flow and we joined forces and he called me to go pick up something to see something. And I remember telling him like, look, but I always had this thing like, man, I shouldn't mess with him. And I did. And so uh, my dad called and he asked mm -hmm. to come. And I told him, I said, hey, look, the time that you're asking me to come doesn't look good. You know, I let him know where I was, the situation I was in. I'm like, this don't look good for me to be getting up and leaving at three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, can we do this at a different time? He's like, no, nah, do it now. And so at this time, you know, my relationship with the young lady wasn't the best. It wasn't a healthy relationship. It was a street life. Um, and like I said, I was totally, my emotional intelligence was so low that I wasn't even able to read signs that I was hurting this woman or that she was upset. And she told me, she says, well, if you leave, stay at that woman's house, don't come back. And I'm like, I couldn't tell her because at the level of the game I was playing, you never disclosed when you picked up or dropped because that's how people get hit, robbed, killed. And so I had to make up a story. And I was trying to tell my dad, I said, hey, I got to get back. Well, he didn't honor what I asked. And so I ended up staying out all night. Stuff wasn't ready until the next day. And so when I came back, in her mind, I was out with a female. And I remember coming back and, and I was so excited because I was like, I got what I needed, but she's pissed. And again, I told you, I was so disconnected from my own body, my own emotions, my own feelings that I didn't even register. Hers were completely irate and she was hurt. And so we had- And this is before cell phones. You couldn't text, you, no one was texting anybody, right? It's just, you had pagers or something, I'm assuming? No, no, cell phones were there. Okay. We, this is right around that era when Star Tech, the di we just got into the digital, okay. the digital phone, we, the basic digital phone. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened was it didn't even matter. Right? It didn't matter. She told me if I left and didn't come back, that's what she was going to believe. And so I remember coming back into the house and she was pissed and she started telling me how she felt. And I just looked at her and I was like, well, look, you know, you can think what you want to think. This is where I'm at. This is what I did. And the conversation led to another, it just shifted. And I remember her telling me, you know, you know, I kill you. And I was like, a part of me was like, shit, go ahead. Like, really? Like, I really was like, it's cool. But then another part of me was like, I didn't want to die, but I wanted to challenge it. Like I, I wanted, I'm, I was, I was so angry inside and so hurt that I would challenge anything. I would challenge any situation that could have take, taken me out. And so I told her, do what you got to do. So she went in the other room, grabbed a gun that I had in the drawer, pointed it at me. And when she realized, she looked me in my eyes and when she realized that I was what, you, what we would say, oh, heartless or cold hearted. It scared her because she's got a gun pointed at me and I, and I show no reaction. And so once she realized that that's what happened, she tried to uncock the gun, but didn't know how. And so when she was lowering the gun, it went off, hit me in the lower abdomen. 
and the bullet exploded inside of me and ripped my through my femoral artery and that's when life shifted for me um completely i had an experience that changed my life forever so um when she had the gun pointing at you what were you what were you thinking i know you said you didn't give her a reaction but what were you, were you thinking she was going to do it or she wasn't going to do it or what was your mindset in that moment? Well, when I looked down the barrel of the gun, I was like, this could be quick, right? In my mind, I'm like, if she does this, it's going to be quick because she's pointing right at me, right? I'm just like, how fast will it happen? And then I'm like, hmm. Part of me is like, like I said, I was so empty. I'd, I'd been carrying so much heaviness that I... I didn't think that she had the guts to do it, but I also was open. I was just open to the experience. I didn't run from it. And I found that to be very interesting in that moment. Mm -hmm. What does it feel like to get shot? What does it feel like to get shot? Well, I got shot with a 38 caliber long grained. So it would be the, Saturday night special edition. That's the one that you usually see the police officers have in their bootstrap in all the movies that backup. And you wonder why they always use that as a backup. It's a powerful caliber pistol, um, the long grain. And when it hit, <laughs> it felt like a semi truck hit, hit my body. Like I was up against a wall. Um, and in that moment, I remember thinking, wow, we definitely could have had a conversation about this. <laughs> okay. I was like, yeah, we could have talked about this. <laughs> um, that was the first thought. Like when it hit me, I was just like, damn, we could have talked about this. We definitely could have worked this one out. And then I don't know why, like, but I saw the look and hurt in her face for the first time. And I instantly had compassion. I was like, damn. Oh. A part of my hurt, I saw it in her. So now I'm that now I'm like, wait, it's starting to make sense what's happening here. Because I can register now where I'm at through her, through the through the through the look in her eye. And she was horrified that she did what she did, right? She's, and so she decides to turn the gun on herself. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. I said, hey, 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 in my mind, I'm like, wait, you can't kill yourself because if I make it and I can't explain why you're dead, <laughs> I'm not going to prison like this. Not in this condition. I'm not going to prison at all is what I'm telling myself. Mm -hmm. And, uh. Are you on the floor? Are you on the couch? Did you get knocked back? Like, well, what's your... I'm twisted up in the middle of the floor, laying in about two inches of just hot blood. And I'm bleeding. And, and I knew in that moment, I said, damn, this isn't like the movies. I said, this is it. From going to school and understanding a little bit about anatomy and going to class and studying the body. And then I used to watch a lot of war movies. And I remember Private Ryan when he got hit in that artery. Mm -hmm. And so I... Instantly, I, I started thinking. I said, I can't panic. And I knew that if my panic, the heart rate goes up, I'll bleed faster. I'm in the inner city. There's no telling when the ambulance will be here. So I got to go to work on myself. And so I remember putting my finger in the hole. And to put my own finger in my own body, shit just got real. I, I connected. It was a connection with myself now. And I'm like, man, well, here it is. And then I just started thinking, I don't have time to cry. I don't have time to think about all the shoulda, coulda, woulda. And I was like, all right, I need to connect. And I remember meditation. My mom would meditate. My dad would meditate. Part of the, the, the practice in the Hare Krishna movement, meditation was part of the practice. So I, I had my first real meditation 
by accident, by default, because I was trying to just calm down. So, so I could prolong mm -hmm. this bleed out situation that was happening. And in that moment, I remember telling her, I said, please just give me a minute, step back. I'm gonna close my eyes, but I'm not dead. She didn't understand that because meditation wasn't something that you heard in the streets. So when I closed my eyes, she thought I was dying. And so I remember I kept smacking me like, wake up. And I'm like, I was like, hey, step back. Like, I need, give me a minute. I got to connect with God. I was like, I got to make, I got to make some transitions here. If I'm going to go, I didn't want to go out. If I, if I, in my mind was, if I have to die, I can't die in this space of fear, panic, or, 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 you know, remorse, like feeling bad about myself. I said, if I want, if I'm going to go out, I need to go out in a state in a higher consciousness of all the stuff that I was taught through the Bhagavad Gita. I need to raise my vibration. I need, I at least need to die in a, in a God consciousness. She, you probably sounded like you were hallucinating to her and you closing your eyes and talking about God, like that may, probably made her think you were, you were about to die. I can but understand that. Something because she knew about the temple life, you know, because I was gone every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I went into that deep state and I had the conversation with God. Mm -hmm. Was there pain at that time during that conversation or had you transcended the pain? I transcended everything from the physical material plane it mm. the, the feeling the the space that i was in was always it was it was that place i always wanted to be it was that feeling that i always wanted to have from my mother from my father it was it was that love and and that comfort that i always wanted to have and i had it in that moment and i knew but i didn't know if i was dead or not I just knew that nothing hurt. Everything felt amazing. It was the most beautiful feeling I'd ever had. And I went from literally burning alive to the most beautiful love felt like harmonious space. And I remember talking to God, I said, Hey God, well, this is it. You know, I apologize. And I was like, as good as this may be. I said, what about my mom? I remember I just kept thinking about my mother. I said, what about my mom? I've never seen her waver in her faith, in her belief, in her teachings this whole time. And I said, so if you can spare me for my mom's sake, please. But if you can't, I understand. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.